All right. Well, just think about it. You know, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but this is the first Sunday in over 140 years that there's not been a Baptist church on that corner over there. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? But it's the first Sunday that there's been one here. It's, uh, you know, time does change things. And that ought to be a sobering thought to your own life. The older I get, the more I realize how short life is and that I'm just passing through. We, we all sing that song, you know. This world's not my home, I'm just passing through. But it's just a song. <laughs> you know, really, we're pretty, we've set up pretty permanent headquarters here, most of us have. But it gets to be real to you that, you know, life's short. We're just passing. Ain't much time to do whatever you're going to do. You don't have much time. So when you're young, you better remember your creator when you're young. You better give your life to God. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your strength. Because I promise you, you will regret it down the road. All right, let's turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, go back there again. I don't hear very many papers rattling. I guess you're already there. Is that what I'm (laughs) trusting that you're already there? I read a thing that was kind of encouraging to me this week, too. It was another, it was a pastor. He said, You know, everybody's always begging for everybody to pray for their pastor and do this for their pastor because the pastor has so much burdens and so much trouble and everybody hates him and everybody lies about him. And, you know, it's all, you know, it's just, well, a lot of that's true. But he said, He said, I have no complaints. I don't want you to misunderstand. He said, I'm happy doing what I'm doing. And this is what God put me here for. And there's more joy in it and more reward. By far than than the burdens and the hurt and all of that. That encouraged me. I get kind of tired of whiny baby, whiny babies. <laughs> and how tough it is and all of that. I mean, stand up. Straighten up your back. Those feeble knees and all of that. Ain't God good enough for you? Any real enough for you? Amen. All right. John chapter 8. Let's read uh, verses 18 and 19 here to start with. Jesus, I'm cutting in in the middle of the conversation, but we were on the verses before this last week, so we're not really breaking in on new ground. It's just a continuation. He said, I am come, I I am one that bear witness of myself. And the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my Father. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. That's all we'll read for the time being here. Father, pray you'd bless your word. Pray everybody be attentive to hear your voice and what's said this morning, what's read this morning. Pray that your spirit would speak to hearts and your word would have free course. Please help us, bless it, give it unction. And Lord, may it make a difference in all of us. Pray that it help us as we walk in this wicked world, the darkness. Lord, help us to be the light of the world by being like you, by walking in your footsteps, by being a true disciple, a follower, and a learner. Help us to be more like you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you really want to be like Jesus? Do you? This is nice. I can look at everybody a whole lot better. Do you really want to be like Jesus? Everybody's first uh, knee-jerk, uh, automatic, reflex act, uh, response to that is, Of course I do. But how do you want to be like him? I mean, do you really want to be like him? That's what all this is about. That's why we're preaching on the life of Christ. We need to know him better. We need to know what he's like so that we can be more like him. Here he is in John chapter 8. I mean, in his fullness as the son of man and the son of God. Clearly here, both. 
is put on display for us very clearly. And if you'll look and listen, if you'll read and study this chapter and this whole conversation that took place, this encounter here with these people, you'll be able to see what Jesus is like. Then you can make up your mind whether you really want to be like him or not. He's dealing with a hostile, hateful, resentful, unbelieving bunch of people who profess religion. That's what he's dealing with. What is our natural response to people like that? Now you just stop and think about it just a minute. When somebody is hateful or gives us a short, sharp answer or, hate, or insults us or slanders us or our family, how do we respond? How do you respond? What's your first response? I mean, maybe you don't say nothing, but what's the response of your heart first? You see, let's dig a little deeper and let's, let's put this on a good foundation. Let's don't just be like Jesus because we can just practice such good self-control that we can make ourselves appear to be like Jesus. When in our heart, man, I'd like to smack you right in your nose. You know, who do you think you are? What is the feeling that comes up? Resentment? Uh, desire for vengeance? Or the, the feeling that we, that we have the right to set them straight. Because somebody needs to do it and I like myself. And I feel like I'm the most qualified to set them straight. That ain't like Jesus. Just telling you that this morning, that ain't what Jesus is like. You won't find a trace of that in this whole chapter. Here it goes back and forth, and that's what we're going to talk about. He, they just insult him and slander him and, and mock him, and he never comes back at them in like manner. He never turns on them. He speaks the truth to them. And when he gets down to the end of the chapter, he's speaking hard truth to them. But it's not in a way that he's angry or, or that he's offended by them. He's just telling them the truth about themselves. And so that's being like Jesus. But he did it with a motive of love. And he did it in grace and truth, not just... Uh, a, a phony facade, a cover-up, like we saw about Wednesday night. I've been thinking about that so much and seeing it and everything I look at. I just see the, the fake, false, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's what man is. Mankind, is a, they're all a bunch of hypocrites practicing hypocrisy. He's trying to help these people. Jesus is here trying to help these people. He didn't come here to argue with them. He didn't come here for that. He didn't come here for a religious debate or some kind of council where we can figure all this out. He didn't come for that. God, his father, did not send him to argue with these guys. And that's not his mission. That's not his purpose. That's not his motive. That's not his desire. That's not what he's there for. He is there to help them. Through all of this, he offers them pardon. He offers them eternal life. He he offers them forgiveness of their sins and they, they just spit on it. He, they, he, he's doing that in every sentence that he speaks to them. Yet this is a crowd of people watching and listening to the, the conversation between him and those who are contentious, mean, rule, and uh, rude and hateful. There's a crowd of people listening to this conversation going on. I mean, here's this little bunch of Pharisees. They're contending with Jesus, and there's a crowd looking on, listening. And that's why it's worth noticing in verse eighteen or verse thirty. I'm all I can't see good here for some reason, but and it's worth noticing in verse thirty. It says this: as he spake these words, many believed on him. Take note. Others are listening. Any honest person looking on and listening 
can figure out who the bad guys and the good guys are pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Everybody's not stupid. Especially when it comes to this. You can pick out pretty quick who's, if there is one that is right and one that is wrong, you can pretty well tell. If you can tell, you can tell if there's one that has a right attitude trying to help and there's one that has a bad attitude trying to destroy, you can tell it pretty quick. Good and evil, you can discern. Most people can discern. God gave man a conscience and unless it's seared and silenced or the mind is reprobate, he'll recognize good and evil when he sees them. And that's what happened there. That's what happens when people are listening to us. In our conversations and all the talk that we do, we should always remember that important fact. Others are listening and considering and many will make up their minds about God by what they hear. That's what happened right there. When they heard, when he, as he spake these words, many believed on him. On him, not them, on him. They listened to the Pharisees and they listened to him and they said, <laughs> we believe him. You talk about our testimony, that's the way it ought to be. That ought to be the effect of it. People shouldn't, they should believe the truth when they hear it. Now there's always going to be people like these Pharisees who will not. But there'll always be some who will. That's the way it is. It always has been Old Testament, New Testament, since the world began. Some believe and some don't. No matter who's speaking it. Whether it's the Lord himself or just want some common person like us. He never loses his focus or his composure toward them. In spite of their insults, in spite of their slanders, in spite of their threatening faces, he speaks the truth in everything that he speaks here. And everything that he says to them is nothing but truth. He doesn't lower himself to their level and use slander and gossip to try to silence them. Do you, re do you, do you reckon he could have? What did he know about them? They thought they knew all about him. But what did he know about them? Everything. Everything. He could have spilled the beans on them right there. And yes, that would have took care of them. That would have put them out of their office. That would have diminished them in the sight of the people till they'd have had to go crawling off somewhere for their lives. He could have very easily. Just as the Son of Man, speaking the words, just telling, just revealing them, telling what they were. But he didn't do that. What did he speak? Truth. The truth of God. The truth that'll set you, that'll make you free. The truth that will bring forgiveness of sin and bring you into knowledge of God. That's all that he spoke about. So do you really want to be like Jesus? Then how, how seeing that we, that all these things should be dissolved, how, what holy conversation, what manner of, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. What should our conversation be like? You know what most people talk about in church, before church? Well, junk. What do people talk about most of the time with anybody, anywhere, any place? Sports, entertainment, junk, just nonsense. Worthless stuff. Our conversation ought to be higher than that. So, he doesn't lower himself down to their level. You know, these were learned, lettered. You know, they said that about the disciples later. said, they don't, you know, they've never studied. I mean, they don't have letters. They, they're uneducated and ignorant men. Not these guys. These weren't ignorant and unlearned men. They were learned men. The best that the world could do. The best that their organized religion could do in that day. That's who these guys were. They're supposed to know the Bible. They're supposed to know the scriptures. 
Why didn't they argue from the Scriptures? Why didn't they present some kind of logical, scriptural response to the Lord Himself and what He was saying to them? Instead of slanders and hateful words and insults. Tells you what's here. Tells you who's who. The people looking on figured it out pretty quick. They figured it out pretty quickly. They were religious scholars and leaders, and yet they didn't present any kind of argument based upon Scripture or doctrine. Look for it. They didn't, didn't argue that way. They didn't try to debate him that way. With every answer they gave, they only hurled personal insults and slanders and accusations against Jesus. They didn't reason from the Scriptures and listen as he explained what he was saying. They only spewed resentment and derision on him because they despised him. Personally, they hated him. He was more like God than anybody they'd ever known because he was God. And they hated him. And that hatred overrode any knowledge they had. Any kind of uh, scripture they knew, they forgot everything. And what justification did they have for despising and hating him? What had he ever done to them that was unjust or unkind? How did he ever mistreated them? He hadn't. No. They had no reason to hate him. No justification for it at all. He'd only went about doing good, helping people. <laughs> you don't have to wrong somebody for them to hate you. No. Mm -mm. So they answered him roughly each time he, they responded to his words, and they proclaimed that whatever he said held no authority or truth and contradicted what he said, saying it was not true there in in verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Thou bearest record of thyself, who are you? Who do you think you are? And who, why do you have a right to say anything about anything? That's the attitude they had. <laughs> Does this ever happen in church? Does it? Well, right, you got to say anything about it. That's, that's attitude, general attitude of everybody nowadays. You know, this age of rebellion and godlessness and disorder has so rearranged everything so that there is no respect for authority of any kind out, out there in the world or in the church. This thing of all men are created equal has been so ingrained in everybody that everybody's got the attitude now that's turned completely around to where you don't, nobody has a right to say anything to anybody else. And you don't have to listen to anything anybody else says. So everybody is the king in their own eyes. You know, everybody's their own judge. Everybody makes up their own morals, their own rules, their own ideas about God and everything else. And so that's why the people don't listen. It used to be people listened with a hunger to hear from God through somebody. Does it ever happen in church? You bet it does. Have you lived long enough to see what happens to people who do that very thing in churches? I have. <laughs> You better take heed. You better be a listener. You better respect the order that God has placed things in. You know. If I'm sitting in a church listening, I'm listening. I'm not the preacher. I'm listening. Somebody else preaching, I'm listening. Because God will speak to me through him. Through that, what he's preaching, God will help me. He'll speak to me. He'll rebuke me. He'll correct me. He'll do something for me. If I listen. And everybody need, better have that attitude. They mocked him. 
and at the same time insulted him by asking where his father was. You get that? Yeah. Where is thy father? Do you understand what they said? Mm -hmm. He said, my father bears witness. I mean, they said, oh yeah? Where is he? Where is your father? That meant a lot of different things. We don't hear your father talking. We don't hear nobody talking but you. What do you mean? Your father bears witness. Where is he? We don't see Joseph or whoever your father was around here. Exactly what they meant. Exactly what they insinuated. They were hateful. Insulting. You know, they derided him. They might as well have spit on him right there. And Jesus didn't respond to them in kind. They insulted his mother. <laughs> well, how many will stand for that? Oh, that's it right there. That gives me the right. Does it? Now, if you really want to be like Jesus... Where do you, where do you, where's that line that gives you the right to throw it all off and rip your shirt off and say, all right, that's it. <laughs> I've been around so many so-called Christians all my life, mainly preachers, who felt like that. Yes. That's just their attitude, boy. Yes, They're ready for a fight anytime. That's as unlike Christ as you can get. It is not weakness and it is not cowardice to refuse to respond and, and lower yourself to their level. Jesus is maintaining his dignity, his holiness, his righteousness by not lowering himself down to respond to them like most everybody else would. So that's the question. Do you really want to be like Jesus? Or does it mean more to you what other people think of you when they say, you know, is, it, does, is the shame of that too much for you to bear? That as to say, I wouldn't have stood for that. I'll tell you, if somebody did that to me, you see a different. He must be a coward. He ain't got no guts. He ain't got no backbone. What a sissy. <laughs> Takes more strength, you know, it's not always physical strength that is lacking to be that. You know, it takes real grit, real character, real backbone, real uh, commitment to God and the help of God's Spirit for you to be that way. Yeah, that's, that is denying yourself naturally. We grew up in this world and that's just the way that we'll think if God don't have the reins of our heart. And if Jesus is not with us, if we don't realize his presence and we don't really walk with him, then we're going to act just like the rest of the world and just like this bunch of ungodly children of the devil is what they are, were, are still. That's what identifies them. They're not like him. We want some physical proof of what you're saying. Where is your father? I mean, if you got another witness, we want to see him, we want to hear him. Never mind that God the Father had already given them this proof and that, that they refused to acknowledge it. I mean, when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The miracles. Everything he had done so far. <laughs> God was the, his witness. As God is my witness. What does that mean? God has done something. You saw my witness. When you witness something, you tell what you know. That's why so many people can't witness because they don't know anything. Or they don't know the right thing. Or what they think they know is wrong. What did Paul tell Felix? And what did Paul tell Agrippa? He told him what he knew. Yes, sir. 
This one thing I know. <coughs> That's witnessing. Tell them what you know. Now you got to know something first. God witnessed Christ. Jesus was the Lord. He mocked him again. They mocked him again by insinuating he was mad and suicidal. Well, he's crazy. He's a, that, you ever hear him? Does that ever happen? You ever heard that about some other Christian or some preacher who was sincere and zealous for the Lord? Man, I have. I can give you names. I've had them say it about me. Crazy. Crazy. What did uh, Reggie Kelly say here? I heard him say it the other day. He said some guy told somebody else. One of the guys come and told him about talking to this other man out there and said, well, he's, old Kelly, he's a good, he's a good guy, but said he's just a, a religious nut or something like that. Fanatic. He's a religious fanatic. That means crazy. That's what people, that's what they said here. Well, what is he? They said, then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whether I go, you cannot come. That, he's so crazy. Have you ever heard anybody say things like this? I knew, I had a guy tell me this one time. He said, I knew a guy that got to reading the Bible like you talk about and said, you know what happened to him? Said they found him on the side of the road twiddling his thumbs, nutty as a fruitcake. He lost his mind. <laughs> hey, told me that. I've had different ones tell me that thing will drive you crazy. You'll lose your mind. That's what they said. Well, he, he'll probably just kill himself. He's out of his mind. Nuts. What did Felix say to Paul? Much learning hath made thee mad. You're crazy. You're crazy. You've lost your mind. All right. They mocked him and they said all kinds of things about him. They asked him in derision, Who art thou? Now that wasn't a sincere question of wanting to know whether he was really the Son of God or not. It was more like, what, Who do you think you are by talking to us like this and saying these things? They said, Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said to them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. He speaks with authority. He's speaking with authority here because he's speaking truth. And they say, who are you? Who are you? Who do you think you are? What right do you have to speak to us like this? Does that ever happen? Because pride reigns in the hearts of most people. Yeah, that's very common. And it's, it's how people miss God. That's like we talked about last week. People won't listen to a man. See? They refuse to listen for the voice of God in a man, in the voice of a man, because they consider themselves more able to find out the truth themselves. That's, that's another thing about this rebellious generation and this last degenerate generation before the Lord comes. They think, everybody thinks they can figure it all out for themselves. I have always needed help. Still do. I always seek help. And, and I appreciate help. Other men help me to understand things that I didn't before. Happens all the time. If you read, if you listen, there'll be words said that, you know, you'll say, oh, why didn't I understand that? Somebody helped me. That's why we come to church. That's why we have preaching in church. I mean, that's what this is about. It's the edification of the saints. It's to bring us to that Statue, measure the statue of the fullness of Christ so we be more like him. And that's the question this morning. You really want to be like Christ? Do you really? Well, then you got to listen. You got to have a heart to listen. You can't question everybody that comes up. You know, every preacher that stands behind this pulpit, including me, they're just men. Yes. But God put them here at a certain hour in your life 
for you to listen to. And if they're walking with God at all, or maybe even if they're not walking with God, God still will minister to your soul through them. Because you'll listen to the manner that God set up for this. It's the preaching of the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And then what does the rest of it say? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So that's the, that's the way God set it up. Like it or not, you know, people have, they've just shucked off everything nowadays. I was reading there a while ago about a, now they've got a Christian nightclub in Nashville. And you can go there and there's no, here's the rules. No twerking, no drinking, and no smoking. But everything else goes. They got smoke, you know, they've got uh, all kinds of throbbing music, it said, Latin music, you know, rap music, everything. You dance, you do everything, and they have prayer before everybody starts. And it's for people, they said, who've left, who don't go to church. Christians who don't go to church. Started by five black guys. One of them's got a high education. Now, why would they do that? Let me ask you that. What, why do you, what, what are they going to get out of this? Money! Money! That's right. Money. Off the souls of people. Just taking advantage of the ignorance of foolish people who won't listen to preaching, but they want to have some kind of religion in their life. They don't really want to be like Jesus because Jesus wouldn't have anything to do with anything like that. And anybody with one eye and a half sense, I shouldn't say that, but because I said that one time, there was somebody just had one eye. So I thought, anybody with any sense can tell that is not of God. That's of the world. That's of the darkness. That's wickedness. Yes. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Well, they don't know the Bible says that because they don't read the Bible and they won't listen to anybody tell them what the Bible says because they know better than anybody else. That you know, All preachers are crooks and dummies and lazy and just in it for the money. So nobody will listen. Well, it was happening a long time ago. It's not just a thing of this generation. It's always been this way. But what they're doing most of the time is simply following their own heart and being a fool because that's what the Bible says. Isn't that right? They cast aside his promise of forgiveness and freedom from sin because of who they think themselves to be. You know, their pedigree. We're, Abraham is our father. Now that's, well, Abraham's our father. Do you know what family we belong to? Do you know who our ancestors were? Their heritage or their position. They answered him, verse 33, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? He just told them that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And they, that's what they said. Well, that is, I'm, I'm sorry, I quoted the wrong verse. But he offered them freedom from sin here. Let me see here. Verse 33, let me get in the right place. Yes, I did quote the right verse. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And this was their response. <laughs> what do you mean, free what? We're, we are the seed of Abraham. We were never in bondage to any man. Most don't understand... Or realize that they're in bondage until it drags them to the bottom. Or someone representing God points it out to them. 
Do y'all understand what I'm talking about here? If you, you know, any of the sins of the flesh, whatever you want to, whichever one you want to pick out, if the preacher from the pulpit starts naming it and you're sitting there guilty and involved in that sin, (laughs) what's that going to do to you? When he... When he declares to you that God will set you free from it. You know, you, you are, well just, you know, I can quit anytime I want to. Is that a fact? Well then why don't you do it? Why don't you quit your drugs, your cigarettes, your, your drinking, your immorality, your hatefulness, your bad spirit toward everybody else, your unbelief, your grumbling and mumbling and complaining all the time, why don't you just quit it then? When it's demanded of you, then you realize you're in bondage. Most don't understand that it's still this way with uh, religious people. They react the same way to true gospel preaching. They react the same way these guys did. They say, we're okay. Ain't nothing wrong with us. We don't need anything. We're good like we are. We, this is the way we've done it. The way we've always done it. It's okay. You're just the first preacher that's come along and said anything about it. Are you the only one? Who are you? I mean, by what authority do you say these things to us? Everybody else says something different than you. You see, it's the same old story. Most would rather find their security and peace in their position or their pedigree than in confessing and forsaking their sin. That's a thing of human nature all across the board. That's why Hunter Biden thinks he's going to get off scot-free because of who he is. That's why he he mocks and laughs at everybody over his crimes because he thinks he's covered because of who he is my daddy's the president see people are the same way when it comes to this this here and their souls that's why all the preaching on positional truth and being one of the elect and the inability of man and the unconditional eternal security based on a profession of faith is so popular and well received. Are you listening to me? Positional truth. Well, that's a big doctrine. That's founded fast in Calvinism, like most things are. But rest in your position, not in anything else. You're in Christ, so just rest in that. Rest in that. That's why it's so popular. It don't require anything of you. Nothing. Nothing is required of you. No matter what you do, you maintain your position. It's fixed. Nothing can change it. You're okay. That that tells me it's false right there. Something wrong. Something wrong in that. But they'll go on preaching it, and people will go on glorying in it. And, and I've watched it. I watched who glories in that kind of preaching. Yes, sir. Yes. And it's not the people who are living right. That's right. It's the one, ones who are not. That, that shures up their false hope. It helps them to rest easy in, in a house of cards they've built. Is their hope for heaven. That's what these guys were doing. We're Abraham's seed. Do you know who you're talking to? We ain't Samaritans. And we're not Hittites or Amorites or any of that. We're not Gentiles. We are the seed of Abraham. Abraham is our father. You can't tell us. There's something wrong with us. It also explains why preaching that condemns sin is to its very roots is and exposes it and demands repentance and a new birth 
is rejected as sinless perfection preaching. That explains that to me. Again, they insult Jesus and his mother by insinuating that he was born of fornication while they themselves have a clean pedigree. In verse 41, Jesus said, Ye do the deeds of your father. <laughs> then they said to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. That was a, that was a direct insult to him. Sure. We read in the same book here, what, isn't this Jesus and, you know, his brothers and his sister? Don't we know them? Isn't this the carpenter? They know about his family. This only happened like 30, a little over 30 years ago. Mary, Joseph. People don't forget things. <laughs> Especially things like that. Have you ever thought about the reproach that Mary and Joseph had to bear? They had to live with people thinking that about them, even though they knew better. They, their lives were really spent for, you know, I mean, that's how they had to live under that reproach. Bear the, bearing the reproach of Christ. They knew, they knew the truth, but nobody else really did know the truth. And so everybody believed what these Pharisees said here. Think of Jesus in that position. What would you do? How would you feel? I mean, if they come out with that in front of everybody and only you knew the truth and your mother and your father and everybody else didn't. I mean, they just saw what happened and what do you, how, I mean, what would you expect them to believe? I mean, for most people, this would have ended the conversation right here because well, ain't no use talking to them. They just, if that's what they think about me, my family, you know, I've got no right to even speak to them. They thought they had him, but they didn't. What do you do when you can't refute the Scripture and reason? I mean, what can you do when you can't refute the Scripture and reason but try to discredit the speaker but it, by accusing his mother of sin? You see, that's what that was. It was not... It wasn't... It was an insult to him, but it was much more to his mother. I mean, how, where does... What kind of people are you talking to when they revert to that? To try to shut you up. When they revert to that to try to win this argument they're trying to argue with you. What kind of people are you dealing with? When you're in a corner and truth's cutting you deep, just attack and slander his whole family so that others will know he has no credibility. Do people judge others by their families? Sure. You better believe it. Not people who are like Jesus. They don't. But everybody else does. They judge somebody by their family, by their name. I remember a boy down there, where Sarah's at, a few years ago. And his family was just, you know, they were drunkards. Bad, wasted, and the family was, I mean, it had run in the family. And this young boy was trying to do right and not follow in all of their footsteps. But everybody had very little confidence in him because of his family. And that's something that we believe I mean, we're so reluctant to believe God, and yet we, we believe strongly that human nature and sin has more power than God does. Yeah. Has to start somewhere. Can't condemn somebody for their whole family. They just, then they just come right out and accuse him. 
of being under the control of the devil. Here in verse 48, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Do you all understand what it meant when they called somebody a Samaritan? It was like a racial slur, insult. That's what it was. Not only did they call him, say he had a devil, but they said he was a Samaritan that had a devil. I mean, they, they just keep cutting him lower and lower as they can cut him with their insults. Why don't, these are Bible scholars. Why don't they talk scripture? Because they ain't about that. It's like I told you before, that church up in Pennsylvania that time, they were getting rid of their preacher and that's and one of the guys went in there and tried to kind of quell the situation, but they were all, it was like a lynch mob. They said, you just shut your mouth. We're mowing grass tonight. That was their attitude. So. Same, same bunch. Same spirit that ruled in them, ruled in this bunch right here that we're reading about. No scripture, no reason, no God, no love, no forgiveness, forbearance, no, none of that. We're going to draw blood. That's what these guys are fixing to do. You know how this ends, don't you? Have you read to the end of the chapter? <laughs> these blind people are looking in the face of Jesus. And listening to the very words of God himself and believe they're listening to the devil. Whew. What hope can there be for such a people like that? When people cannot or will not discern the voice of God from the voice of the devil, there's nowhere else to go with it except exactly where Jesus went with it here. He spoke truth, not insult or slander, when he said in, chi in verses 44 and 45, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there was no truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Now Jesus said that to them. Ye are of your father the devil. He didn't say it with malice. And he didn't say it uh, with contempt for them. Remember, he's here to help them. Not, he's not here to argue with them. and to insult. He's not here to win an argument. He's here to help these people. Then they reaffirmed their notion that he's letting the devil talk through him and again deride him for his promise of escaping death. In verses 52 and, through and 53. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. But we're sure now. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Well, these are Pharisees. They believed in the resurrection, you know. Remember when Jesus told them he's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Abraham, he's the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. He's the God of the living, not of the dead. What did that mean? That meant they were still alive. Yes. Not on earth, but they weren't dead. Yeah. They were gathered unto their fathers. Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? There we go again. See, who do you think you are? Anyway, saying this kind of stuff. They, they, they just prove their complete carnality and, any, and lack of any kind of spiritual understanding by stating that Jesus is not old enough to have known Abraham. <laughs> then said the Jews unto him, verse 57, Thou art not yet 50 years old. Boy, they had, he was 30 years old. They was really, they wasn't cutting him much slack there, were they? Thou art not yet 50 years old. They could have said, you're... You're just barely 30 years old. But they didn't, you know. 
Just another way to insult. And hast thou seen Abraham? Just think of the mind of these people that he's talking to. You know, any kind of a person that has any kind of understanding about them ought to have pity on people like this. They're so empty and they're so void of any understanding and knowledge, really. I mean, they're just arguing out in la-la land here. You know, do, do they really think that he's trying to say to them you know, that he knew Abraham? Uh, you know, he had been alive that long and all of this. I mean, physically. That, that's all they were thinking is physically and carnal things. They couldn't see past worldly, the worldly realm. So finally, they just take up stones to kill him. In verse 59. Of course, you know, you know what happened between there. Well, let's just read it just for good measure here. He said, If I say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And the Jews said, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, that did it right there. They knew what he was saying about himself with those two little words. Three letters, I am. That rung in their ears. They remembered enough Bible to remember that. And then what they do? They t then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So that's like when the church fires the preacher, or when a good family's run off by the carnal, worldly church members. That's what that's like. He left. When he leaves, what are you left with? When Cain went out from the presence of the Lord forever. When the Lord departs, what hope have you got then? Now you don't have to listen to it no more. That's for sure. But you have no hope. The wonderful words of life. That's how it, that's how it happens. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we stop listening to words, there's no hope for us. Let me ask you some questions here and we'll be done. What would it be like if all who named the name of Christ would just be like him? In all of this, he didn't re you see how he responded. Now I'm, I've hurried, but it's, there's so much more there to say. What if no one ever hurt anyone else with their words. You better be careful because you're going to get to the time, the moment in your life when that's really going to matter to you. When it's going to mean a whole lot for you to be able to lay there on your deathbed and be able with a clear conscience to say, I, I've not hurt as far as I know. I've not hurt someone intentionally with my words or anything else, any other way. Jesus never hurt anybody. He caused these people great distress because he was telling them the truth and they were wrong. And how are you ever going to get them to salvation if you don't tell them the truth? But you have to tell them the truth. You have to speak the truth in love. And it has to be grace and truth. And mercy and truth. It can't just be slaying people with the truth. The truth's not our club to beat everybody with. To beat them into submission. You can't do that with the truth. It's the spirit behind the truth is what makes it alive. And makes it effective. What if everyone just spoke truth without any ill intent or malice. And only with the pure motive of helping someone. 
Think about that. Now think about that a minute. What if, we, if that's the way it was, every word that came out of our mouth, every time we tried to talk to somebody, we sincerely, our only motive was to help them. What if everybody responded to the insults and slanders of others with grace and truth? What if everybody responded like Jesus responded to every insult, every offense, every slander, every lie, every injustice done to us? What if all of us here this morning reacted like Jesus did? Just us little crowd here this morning. You think it'd make any difference in the world? Yes! There's more here. Then we're in that, uh, than, than Jesus had at the Last Supper. Yes, they turned the world upside down. What if everyone was willing to lay down their life for the truth to the point of being put to death for it? Jesus said, I lay down my life for my friends. And if he laid down his life for us, then we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. Yes, for the truth. Jesus was. Are you? Are you willing to? I mean, and we're not talking about truth like Baptist doctrine or identity with some group or clan or whatever. We're talking about truth. Like Jesus talked about, he spoke truth. It's different what most religious people now consider to be truth. It's like the Middle Ages. We all got our castles and our moats and our, you know, our spears and our armor. And boy, we all isolated off in our little co- And you got to have, truth is being loyal to your tribe. No, truth is being loyal to God in His Word. And the Spirit of truth as well. It starts with each one of us as we sit in church today. Let me tell you something that I really do believe. I really do believe this. I believe that we can make a difference in this world with our few if we'd only take heed to this right here this morning. Do you really want to be like Jesus? If you do, and you will, then you will make a difference in this world. And all of us together doing that would make a great difference. I guarantee you. How, how many people do you think that we have touched with our circle this week, all of us, everywhere we've been, everybody we've talked to, everybody we've been around. <clears throat> it's a bigger circle than you can imagine. And then you take on top of that just the people that listen here. And I mean, it's a big wide circle of influence. And most of them, all they hear is words, the words. The words that are spoken. So let's be careful. If we're going to be like Jesus, we're going to have to start with how we with that tongue right there. And that tongue's controlled by this heart right here. And so this heart needs to be right. We need to be like Jesus in here. Not just here. If it's just here, it's fake. It's a facade. It's hypocrisy. But if it's in here. Do you really, can you feel sorry for people when they accuse you falsely? When they just treat you like dirt? When they're disrespectful and uncaring and ungrateful? Do you, how do you feel in here? 
That's, that's very important right there. It's got to be dealt with there at the root. See, we're not just training a bunch of, of uh, you know, minions here to go and do certain things and say certain things and act a certain way. This ain't a Jehovah's Witness training center here. <clears throat> it has to start in the heart. Check yourself. The Spirit of God will check you if He's in you. And you're listening for His voice. Yes, when you say things, when you do things, He'll check you if He lives in you. Amen. Father, thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for helping us with it, helping me. I pray somebody else to get some help out of this. I want to walk closer to you. I want to be more like you really do. I don't want to be spotted by this world and I don't want to be in bondage to feelings and, and pride of heart. And Lord, I want to be free, free to follow you and to be like you and to live above this world and its ways and its lowly, low things. Lord, help me. I pray you to help these folks to do likewise. Time's short. The days are numbered. And we don't have much longer to, to work while we can. Please help us to be preparing ourselves for you when you come. By being like you in this world. We're the light of the world, you said. You're the light of the world. Now we the light of the world, in as much as we reflect your light. Please help us with this, Lord. It's deeper than I've went this morning. It's much more than I can express and that I'm able to get across. I pray, Spirit of God, you'd work in every heart and life and that we'd go away from here with this deep in our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.